Praised be delusion, the ripple. Praised be the holy ocean of eternity. Praised be I, writing, dead already and dead again. Hello, and welcome to the second episode of The Pojo Show, a collection of poetry, fiction, drama, and spoken word. I'm Jedediah Smith, and I'm with my co-host and co-producer, Batty Royale. The Pojo Show, which I'll have to admit is what's called a podcast, a term I dislike, grew out of my broadcast FM radio show on poetry. What I did then, and we do now, is spin discs of recorded poetry, just like a DJ would play songs. Each week we'll focus the poem selections around a motif, mix the poetry, spoken word, drama, and other forms of spoken literature with music and sounds, and present it to you as an integrated whole. This week, in keeping with our subject matter inspired by responses to the coronavirus, our motif is the topic of illness. Last week's show focused on the literature of plagues and pandemics, so in contrast, this week we'll share voices dealing with illness on a more individual level. We have poems by Sharon Olds, James Dickey, Kevin Young, and the couple Donald Hall and Jane Kenyon, who dealt with and wrote about Jane's leukemia right up to her death. We'll start with an anonymous traditional verse about illness, a song whose actual origin remains a mystery. But in all the theories of its development, it provides a map to the American folk process. It even goes under a variety of names, but we'll call it the St. James Infirmary Blues. I went down to the St. James Infirmary I saw my baby there Stretched out on a cold white table So sweet, so cold, so fair Let her go, let her go, God bless her Wherever she may be She can search this wide world over She'll never find a man like me me in straight lace shoes box back coat and a Stetson hat put a $20 gold piece on my watch chain so the boys will know that I died standing fast His stillness. The doctor said to my father, you asked me to tell you when nothing more could be done. That's what I'm telling you now. My father sat quite still, as he always did, especially not moving his eyes. I had thought he would rave if he understood he would die, wave his arms and cry out. He sat up, thin and clean, in his clean gown, like a holy man. The doctor said, There are things we can do which might give you time, but we cannot cure you. My father said, Thank you. And he sat, motionless, alone, 
with the dignity of a foreign leader. I sat beside him. This was my father. He had known he was mortal. I had feared they would have to tie him down. I had not remembered. He had always held still and kept quiet to bear things, the liquor a way to keep still. I had not known him. My father had dignity. At the end of his life, his life began to wake in me. Well, you see, it is, I have treated many old people, and it's quite interesting to, to watch what the unconscious is doing with the fact that it is apparently threatened with a complete end. Uh, it disregards it. it. Life behaves as if it were going on. And uh, so I think it is better for old people to live on, to, to look forward to the next day. Uh, as if uh, he had to spend centuries and then he lives properly. Window by James L. Dickey. I have just come down from my father. Higher and higher he lies above me in a blue light shed by a tinted window. I drop through six white floors and then step out onto pavement. Still feeling my father ascend, I start to cross the firm street, my shoulder blade shining with all the glass the huge building can raise. Now, I must turn round and face it and know his one pain from the others. Each window possesses the sun as though it burned there on a wick. I wave like a man catching fire. All the deep dyed window panes flash and behind them, all the white rooms, they turn to the color of heaven. Ceremoniously, gravely, and weakly, dozens of pale hands are waving back from inside their flames. Yet one pure pain among these is the bright, erased blankness of nothing. I know that my father is there in the shape of his death still living. The traffic increases around me like a madness called down on my head. The horns blast at me like shotguns and drivers lean out driven crazy. But now my propped up father lifts his arm out of stillness at last. The light from the window strikes me and I turn as blue as a soul as the moment when I was born. I am not afraid for my father. Look, he is grinning. He is not afraid for my life either. As the wild engines stand at my knees, shredding their gears and roaring, and I hold each car in its place for miles, inciting its horn to blow down the walls of the world, that the dying may float without fear in the bold blue gaze of my father. Slowly, I move to the sidewalk, 
with my pin-tingling hand half dead at the end of my bloodless arm. I carry it off in amazement, high, still higher, still waving, my recognized face, fully mortal, yet not, not at all, in the pale, drained, otherworldly stricken, created hue of stained glass. I have just come down from my father. Through vaults of pain, enribbed and wrought with groins of ghastliness, I passed, and garish spectres moved my brain to dire distress, and hammerings, and quakes, and shoots, and stifling hotness, blent with webby, waxing things, and waning things, as on I went. Where lies the end to this foul way? I asked with weakening breath. There on ahead I saw a door extend, the door to death. It loomed more clear, at last I cried, the all-delivering door. And then, I knew not how, it grew less near than theretofore. And backslid, all the galleries by which I came, And tediously the day returned, and sky and life the same. And all was well, old circumstance resumed its former show, And on my head the dews of comfort fell as ere my woe. I roam anew, scarce consciousness of my late distress, and yet those backward steps through pain I cannot view without regret. For that dire train of waxing shapes and waning passed before, and those grim aisles must be traversed again to reach that door. The Sick Child Oh, mother, Lay your hand on my brow. O oh, mother, mother, where am I now? Why is the room so gaunt and great? Why am I lying awake so late? Fear not at all, the night is still. Nothing is here that means you ill. Nothing but lamps the whole town through. And never a child awake but you. Mother, mother, speak low in my ear. Some of the things are so great and near. Some are so small and far away. I have a fear that I cannot say. What have I done? And what do I fear? And why are you crying, mother dear? Out in the city, sounds begin. Thank the kind God, the carts come in. An hour or two more, and God is so kind. The day shall be blue in the window blind. Then shall my child go sweetly asleep and dream of the birds and the hills of sheep. Let me sleep and dream of sheep. to the hotel near the children's hospital. Praise the restless beds. Praise the beds that do not adjust, that won't lift the head to feed or lower for shots or blood or raise to watch the tinny TV. Praise the hotel TV that won't quit its murmur and holler. Praise visiting hours. Praise the room service that doesn't exist, just the slow delivery to the front desk of cooling pizzas and brown bags leaky, greasy, and clear.
Praise the vending machines. Praise the change. Praise the hot water and the heat or the loud cool that helps the helpless sleep. Praise the front desk who knows to wake room 120 when the hospital rings. Praise the silent phone. Praise the dark drawn by thick daytime curtains after long nights of waiting awake. Praise the waiting, and then praise the nothing that's better than bad news. Praise the wake-up call at 6 a.m. Praise the sleeping in. Praise the card hung on the door like a whisper, lips pressed silent. Praise the stranger's hands that change the sweat of sheets. Praise the checking out. Praise the going home to beds unmade for days. Beds that won't resurrect or rise, that lie there like a child should, sleeping tubeless. Praise this mess that can be left. I see the sword of Damocles is right above your head. They're trying a new treatment to get you out of bed. But radiation kills both bad and good, it cannot differentiate. So to cure you, that must kill you. The sword of Damocles hangs above your head. seen lots of people die from car crashes or drugs Last night on 33rd Street I saw a kid get hit by a bus But this drawn out torture over which part of you lives is very hard to take To heal you they must kill you The sword of Damocles above your head your doctor of infectious disease if she's read Williams. He cured sick babies, I tell her, and begin describing the spring and all. She's staring at the wall, now the floor, now your chart, now the door. Never heard of him, she says, but I can't stop explaining how important this is. I need to know your doctor believes in the tenacity of nature to endure. I'm past his heart attack, his strokes, and now as if etching the tombstone myself, I find I can't remember the date he died, or even the year. Of what now are we the pure products? And what does that even mean, pure? Isn't it obvious? We are each our own culture, alive with the virus that's waiting to unmake us. Take with me where I go a pen and a golden bowl. Poet and beggar step in my shoes or a prince in a purple shawl. I bring with me when I
I wondered, um, in 1994, I, I think that's the year yep. um, Jane um, had leukemia, and that was a kind of 15-month struggle until right. her death. She died in 95. Yeah. I wondered if you would um, like to read a poem that came out of that particular time in your life. Well, uh, did you have a poem in mind? Uh, I have poems of the illness and then of poems of grief. Uh, would you like to read one of the illness and, d and the, the ship pounding? With that, oh, that's a lovely poem. Okay. I love that poem. The ship pounding and the um, the ship is the hospital where she is all day, and where I spend almost all day with her. The ship pounding. Each morning I made my way among gangways, elevators, and nurses' pods to Jane's room to interrogate the grave helpers who tended her through the night, while the ship's massive engines kept its propellers turning. Week after week, I sat by her bed with black coffee and the globe. The passengers on this voyage wore masks or cannulae or dangled devices that dripped chemicals into their wrists. I believed that the ship traveled to a harbor of breakfast, work, and love. I wrote, when the infusions are infused entirely, bone marrow restored, and lymphoblasts remitted, I will take my wife, bald as Michael John Jordan, back to our dog and day. Today, months later at home, these words turned up on my desk. As I listened in case Jane called for help, or spoke in delirium, ready to make the agitated drive to emergency again for readmission to the huge vessel that heaves water month after month without leaving port, without moving a knot, without arrival or destination, its great engines pounding. The sick wife stayed in the car while he bought a few groceries. Not yet fifty, she had learned what it's like not to be able to button a button. It was the middle of the day, and so only mothers with small children or retired couples stepped through the muddy parking lot. Dry cleaning swung and gleamed on hangers in the cars of the prosperous. How easily they moved with such freedom. Even the old and relatively infirm. The windows began to steam up the cars on either side of her pulled away so briskly that it made her sick at heart And that will close our set for this episode of The Pojo Show. That was Maggie Hollenbeck singing a poem called The Sick Wife by Jane Kenyon, accompanied by Graham Sobelman on piano. That's just one selection from a three-album set of Kenyon's poems set to music, produced by Sobelman and Hollenbeck. That kind of project is an extreme rarity in poetry in English, especially contemporary poetry. In other cultures like India, in the case of someone like Rabindranath Tagore, or Latin America with Caetano Veloso, the crossover between music and poetry is common, 
but here we usually keep the spoken word and the sung word separate. And people are oddly hostile to the idea that song lyrics are poetry and poetry can be a song lyric. Kenyon was married to fellow poet Donald Hall, and the two of them frequently wrote about each other and their life together on a farm in New Hampshire. So for them it was natural that even when Jane was diagnosed with leukemia, they wrote poems about her being sick, each of them dealing with it, the understanding that she was going to die, and then Hall's poems of mourning after her death. So we chose to include one of his poems mourning her loss, The Ship Pounding. Before that, we played Old Welsh Song by Henry Treese, sung by Joan Baez, which is another example of poetry becoming song. Treese was a British writer, very prolific in spite of dying in his mid-50s, and he's known now mainly for his young adult novels, but I really love his poetry. He was part of a group in the 1930s that called themselves the New Apocalyptics and they were bound together by their rejection of the heavy political realism of that time. Then each poet took off in a personal direction, and Treese, his style was to incorporate a lot of Celtic mythology into his work. And in that group's celebration of Englishness, they remind me of the Southern agrarians in the United States, who also wanted to explore a sense of place in their writing. Now, the album by Joan Baez that this comes from is entitled Baptism, and it's mainly a spoken word album. Uh, but as on this song, many of the poems have been given a musical setting by Peter Shickley. And people still call this pretentious because it dared cross that line, including music and spoken word together. Before Baez, we included a live reading by Brian Russell of the poem The Year of What Now? which is the title work from his book, which came out in 2013 and won the Breadloaf Writers Conference Bakeless Prize. We played another live reading before that, Ode to the Hotel Near the Children's Hospital by Kevin Young, who is incredibly prolific, publishing a new book of poems every other year since 2000. Between those two poems, we included a section of Lou Reed's song, Sword of Damocles, from his Magic and Loss album, which was at least in part a song cycle about the illness and death of two friends. And before those poems, we did a reading of The Sick Child by Robert Louis Stevenson, a poem that seems autobiographical, but could also be about family members because he suffered from either bronchitis or tuberculosis for most of his life, as did others on his mother's side. Before Stevenson, we played a reading by David Moore of Thomas Hardy's A Wasted Illness, where he laments that his illness probably won't kill him. Now, I'm not going to dispute Hardy's greatness as a writer, but ever since I first read him as part of my master's program in literature, I found him to be the most depressing writer in the English language. I also want to take off on a tangent here and mention the music we played along with that reading. It was called Nightwalker by Delia Derbyshire, who was a pioneer in electronic music, working for the BBC and on various film and television projects. She was part of the radiophonic workshop making sound effects in the pre-synthesizer days with oscillators and reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Probably the best known story about her is that she was tasked with recording the Doctor Who theme, which had been composed by Ron Grainier, another composer I really like. And when he first heard it, he was so blown away by what she'd done, how she'd expanded it. He asked her, did I really write this? And she said, most of it. But when Grainier attempted to get her a co-composer credit, the BBC wouldn't allow it because they wanted their techie people to be anonymous. She wouldn't be credited on screen for her work until Doctor Who's 50th anniversary special. So I haven't known her by name, but I've enjoyed her work for a long time, especially since she created all the electronic sounds for the score of the classic horror film, one of our favorites, the Legend of Hell House. 
Our poem before that was by James Dickey, and it's called The Hospital Window, and it was read by Lily Wallace as part of the Poetry Out Loud project, which gets young people into memorizing poetry and reciting it in front of audiences. And before that, Batty read Sharon Old's poem entitled His Stillness about her father. And finally, all the way back at the beginning, we started off with the St. James Infirmary Blues, performed here by Isto. Next Friday, which will be July 17th, we'll post our next episode in this series on the pandemic. The motif for that edition will be isolation, since that's something we've all been dealing with due to the coronavirus. We'll be playing poems that have to do with loneliness, being stir-crazy, getting a little weird with isolation, but also more serious poems about imprisonment and oppression that go way beyond the difficulties of staying home and binge-watching Netflix. Future shows will continue to explore this, but after our fifth program on the virus outbreak, we're going to move on to other topics, doing shows that focus on individual writers we like, such as... Exene Cervenka. And Michael C. Ford and maybe the Venice West Beat Generation. And maybe you. (laughs) Please, if you enjoyed the show, give us a thumbs up and a comment. If you have suggestions, we'd like to hear those too. And if you have recordings of your own poetry that might fit with the motif of any of our upcoming shows, let us know. How will you know what those are? Well, go to my website, Jedediah Smith. Dot net and that is dot net not dot com unless you want to learn about my forebear the explorer Jedediah Smith and so that wraps it up for this week and until next week stay cool cats and kittens and speak freely and keep watching the skies <laughs>